when we read that when Jesus rose from the dead, he was seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places above all. That includes the enemy. The Bible teaches about how when Jesus conquered sin and death on the cross and with his resurrection, how he fully, in doing that, disarms the principalities and the powers and the rulers of darkness. As it were, in the Garden of Eden, he truly is the seed of the woman prophesied in Genesis 3.15, who stomps out, who crushes the head of the serpent, that old serpent, Satan. And so when we talk about the enemy, when we talk about spiritual warfare, we're approaching it from a place of victory that has already been achieved in Christ and that we're getting to enter into to continue to take ground. We'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. But first... He's not merely saying, be strong, go for it. I hope you worked out. He's saying, be strong in light of everything he has already said and prayed. Not only did he pray for our enlightenment and, and, and that we would realize that we can tap into this power, like I just read in, in, in Ephesians 1, but also in Ephesians 2, he talks about when we were raised out of darkness and death into life and light. Ephesians 2 starts out with with this, this dark backdrop. We were all once dead in sin and, and following the course of the prince of the power of the air. This is language about the enemy, right? This is referring to Satan and demonic and, and, and evil spirits. We were dead in sin, and and the Bible teaches we were slaves in the kingdom of darkness to sin and death. We were enemies of God, rebelling against God. But then Paul in Ephesians writes this classic but God statement, right? And he says, but God, even though we were dead in sin, even though we were rebelling against him, even though we were enemies and under the sway of the wicked one, God, rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he has loved us, he saved us and raised us out of death into life. There's a reason when Jesus hits the scene in the Gospels, proclaiming the good news, his verbiage is very specific. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's always talking about repentance, and he's always talking about the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. God, it says, created all things. And he created humans in his own image and for his own glory. And in Genesis, he commands them and commissions them to go and to take dominion, to rule and reign in his name, bearing his image, spreading his life and light and love throughout all of the world and and over all of the creatures in this world. But then, instead of ruling over it, they fall. And they become enslaved to that deceiver, Satan. He slithers into the story. And and Eve is deceived, and Adam is disobedient. And with that, humanity forfeits the, the right to rule over to the enemy. And where we didn't go and take dominion like we were commanded to, Satan ran with it. He ran with it. 
Satan at some point was, was an angel, a part of the heavenly host. We don't have the time to do an exhaustive study on, on, on all of these things, but I at least want to touch it. He was an angel. He was an archangel. Arguably, perhaps, the most powerful angel that God had created. But he is filled with pride and he rebels against God, wanting to take the place of God. And he leads a third of the angelic host with him in rebellion. And now he has the keys to earth, if you would. He has the title deed to planet earth, if you would. And he runs with it. And he establishes a kingdom in opposition to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God marked by our holy and worthy God. And light. He creates this kingdom. He builds this kingdom that is unholy and dark and evil. And it's crazy because in a lot of ways, I, I, I think often of, there's a line in one of the Star Wars movies where Han Solo says, I used to think it was a bunch of mumbo jumbo. You know, the Jedi and the Force and all this stuff. But obviously then he, he, he comes to realize that it's true. And it's interesting because over time, I, I feel like in some ways that's been my story with all of this stuff. Uh, and, and even where I'm at at this point, sometimes I feel crazy saying it to other people because it does sound uh, out there a bit to talk about a spiritual realm and a spiritual enemy and, and this rebellion in heaven. We're going to talk about it more today. But for now, I, I just want to say that I really have come to a point where because of God's word, but also because of life, I've, I've come to learn and realize that it's not just a bunch of mumbo jumbo. We really do live in this dual reality. There is this physical world with stuff we can touch and see and interact with in a, in a physical way. But there's very in a very real way, angels here and an enemy at work. There's a realm that I can't see, but that is very much real. In chapter one, Paul prays for our enlightenment to even realize the power that we have available to us. In chapter two, he describes how this power has already raised us out of death, out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. And I went on this tangent because I, 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 wanna, I wanna articulate some of this stuff because it can be freaky, it can be scary, it can be intimidating when we hear about all of these things. But it doesn't need to be. Paul's like, I, I've prayed for you. I've demonstrated God's power at work in your life. Those of you who are born again, see how God has raised you out of darkness and into light. This marvelous light. Then also, in chapter 3, he prays for enablement. Where in chapter one, he's praying that we'd be enlightened, we'd, we'd be aware. In chapter three, he prays, right before getting into the practical part of the book, he prays that, that we would uh, turn the key, that, that the, the ignition would fire, that, that these things would engage. He prays for our enablement. 314, for this reason, Paul says, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant to you 
to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. We don't have to figure out how to be strong. It is God who strengthens. He is the source. That he may, verse 16, grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I love the way he finishes this prayer. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to what? The power at work within us. To him be the glory. Paul prays for our enlightenment concerning God's power toward us. Paul demonstrates, looking at your salvation, God's power and strength enacted in us, effective toward us. And then he prays for enablement. He, he prays that, that the ignition would be fired. And so now when he says, finally, be strong. We are freed up to just step into it. To just step into it. To receive it. It's by grace and it's through faith. A simple act of faith to step out and step in to all that God has made available for us in Christ. Namely, in this verse, his strength. Because gospel living is wartime living and we need, we must be strong. Be strong in the Lord, not in your own strength, in the Lord and his strength, in the strength of his might. What's the difference between strength and might? Well, on some level, nothing. Uh, But on another level, if you wanted to tease it out with nuance, I would do so in this way. If a bodybuilder, a muscle man is at the beach and you see his big muscles, his, his, his big muscles display his might. In other words, his potential power, his, his, his strength that is in reserve and that is ready to be activated. The big bulging muscles display his might. But then if he were to pick up a gigantor barbell and curl that bad boy, he would be then exercising his might in what we would call strength. Does that make sense, this nuanced difference I'm making? The might is is the reservoir of, of power available. And the strength is that power effectively being used and activated and, and, and productive. What Paul's saying here, be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might. God is infinite in power and glory. There is nothing that God wills to do that he cannot do. Some people say, well, hey, is God, if God can do anything, can he build a rock? Can he make a rock? so big that he can't lift it? The answer to that question is no, he can't do that. You can't put an illogical conundrum on God and expect it to make sense all of a sudden. (laughs) That's, That's a nonsensical question. There are many things that God can't do. The Bible says God cannot be tempted by evil. He, he, he can't do it. He's not drawn to it. God cannot cease from being God. There are many things that God can't do. God doesn't do nonsense. 
God doesn't do evil. But whatever he wills to do in holiness and love, he does not lack the power to do so. We serve a great and mighty God whose reservoir of might is infinite. Paul's simply saying, by grace and through faith, step into it. Just step into it. Step in, step out, and find it to be true that when you step out upon a surface as unstable as water, like Peter found, you'll find it to be sure ground in the Lord and the strength of his might. Verse 12, or excuse me, verse 11. Then he says, put on the whole armor of God. We'll get back to that. But he says, put on the whole armor of God that or so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So we've established that we do have an adversary. We do have an enemy. Excuse me. And here we get a little bit more information, and that is that he is one who schemes. It's appropriate to picture in your mind's eye a football team in the locker room laboring for hours over film and with, you know, the chalkboard or the whiteboard. I don't think anybody uses chalkboards anymore. Uh, you know, but drawing up the X's and the O's and, and, and scheming, planning, plotting in a way that is strategic with, with a goal in mind. Like a football team does that, so Satan and our enemy these evil spirits, these dark spirits, they scheme and, and plot and strategize. The word scheme, though, also, it refers to specific schemes in the sense of ideology and philosophy and other religions and, and all, all of these things that we see that we tend to assume are, you know, just people writing stuff in books or, or whatever. There's an enemy behind these things that are happening and being taught and being believed. And, and, and there's deception happening. So, so there's the strategic football locker room element of, of him being a schemer. But then there's also, it's, it's, it's not, you know an out that he's planning on throwing or, you know, a blitz that he's, he's planning on doing. It's, it's, we're gonna, we're gonna whisper this in someone's ear. We're gonna, we're gonna teach this in the Ivy League schools. We're, we're gonna legislate that or the other or whatever. We have an adversary. So be strong, Paul says, and put on the armor of God, which we'll get into next week. But, but, but put on the armor of God so that you can stand against him. And when you think standing against, don't just think standing around. Think like first century war. <laughs> We're a bunch of dudes. I'm, I'm a dude. I like war movies. I like that stuff. I just, I, I like it. And uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me and incredible to me to, to imagine being on a field. Some of you have been to Israel and you've been through Megiddo. And, 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 and you've seen where battles have taken place or the Valley of Elah. Once I was there and it was covered with wheat. Weed that you could like, you could pick off like the disciples did. The other time I went though, it was a different part, time of the year, and and it was just, it was just kind of nothing. I was I was shocked because the other time there was a bunch of wheat everywhere, and then this time it, it looked like desert. I was like, 
wow versatile okay uh but but you look around and and i remember walking into the valley of elah where david fought goliath and seeing the brook on my left where you know people who make their living off of tourists come and dump a bunch of rocks so people like me can go and pick five out and pretending i'm david so there's all of those rocks that they've dumped in there and, and, and I'm imagining David and I see the, the bay, it was a lot more sheer than I had imagined. It was kind of steep. Uh, and then the side where the Philistines would have been. I'd have picked that one, honestly. It was a little more rounded. It looked a little, you know, more easy to, to navigate. But, but imagining being out there with all my guys and a shield and a piece of metal and doing it. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Like I put myself in the, in, in that thought and it's just, it's wild. And you know, various strategies people have, you know, throughout different cultures and countries and eras and all of the rest, but they, they stand there and they clash and they hold their ground and advance. That's the imagery. Paul's chained to a Roman guard as he's, as he's writing the book of Ephesians. This is a prison epistle. He's looking at this dude in all of his armor and he's thinking, yeah, that'll preach. That's what we're, that's, that's gospel living. It's, it's being strong. And note the strength comes first because a weak, timid frame even in the best armor, isn't really worth that much on a battlefield, okay? I'd take Goliath, the champion warrior, over, and in and, and no armor, over some random pipsqueak who's kind of a coward in the greatest armor. So first he says, be strong. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. But then he says, put on the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the belt of truth, feet shod with the gospel, all of these things, the shield of faith, the list goes. And, and, and he says, I want you to do this so that you don't fall. You don't need to fall like your first parents and like you traditionally do you were born in sin Jesus he took the fall so that we now in the strength of his might can stand fast can stand strong and not be driven and tossed like a cork in a wave in a storm in the sea we don't have to fall prey to the schemes of the wicked one Then he says, verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This is wildly intriguing to me. And I want to preface everything I'm about to say by saying we really don't know that much. We really don't. We know, we know enough to be clued in to what's going on and effective, effective instruments in God's hands and, and to be strong and withstand and even advanced, uh, advance, pardon me, against the enemy. But we really don't know a ton about the structure and, and, and the ranks and all of this of the kingdom of darkness. And I think a lot of the things that we would like to know more about, God with, withholds some of that information, knowing that we might become overly infatuated in a way that would become a pitfall. A lot of people ask the question, why don't, like, why don't we have any of the original manuscripts of the Bible? All we have is copies. And to that, I would say, because I think we would, we would turn them into idols and worship them. You think I'm crazy? Well, if you've been to Israel, you've seen some of the relics and things that people line up to go 
it was funny. We were we were outside of we were kind of on free time, and a few of us were chilling outside of uh, the tomb, the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, there's there's the Garden Tomb, and then there's this other place. Uh, people debate, you know, which location was where Jesus was buried there uh, in Jerusalem. Well, there's this there's this specific spot, this specific stone that I, I believe it was, I should have checked this, but I, I believe it was where they believed that they had laid the body of Jesus after pulling him down from the cross before putting him in the tomb. And people, I mean, I'm telling you, there was a line when I happened to be there, probably from about this umbrella past the corner of that building. There was like a long line of people on like a Tuesday. And people would come and they would, kneel and they would touch it they would rub it they would pray they would cry uh it was it was a moving thing to kneel there and to consider that wow this i'm i'm touching the place his body touched after it was pulled off of the cross i remember jane our guide she said, hey, you want to know something? And she kind of said it with a smirk. And I was like, yeah, of course. Like, she's really smart and she knows her stuff. And anytime she wants to share something, I'm like, yeah, tell me right now, please. Well, she goes, you know, that that's a random rock. <laughs> and I said, it is. And she goes, yeah. Um, she grew up there and in her lifetime, not, not, historically but just like since she had been living there they had had to replace that rock six times because of the erosion that was happening with so many people coming and and paying homage and and, and all the rest what would we do with scripture what would we do with some of these things There's an old country song that's popping in my mind. I don't even know if it's old or not, but you know, God is great, beer is good, and people are crazy. <laughs> you know, we're just, we're people. We're people. And we just, you know, and, and so there are some things that I think God withholds in wisdom for our good, but he does give us enough. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna share with you the best sense I can make of these four kind of categories of, of the enemy, the enemy ranks that Paul gives us in, in verse 12. But I want to be very clear and say, you read 10 commentaries on this and you'll read 10 different takes. That's not like, there, there are some, I think it's important for us to understand what we believe and to what extent we believe each thing, <laughs> right? I will say with all the authority in the world that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Amen? Not with this, okay? I, I can't say what I'm about to say with the same kind of authority. So I want to be clear about that. But I do want to, I do want to touch it. And, and I want to touch it painting with broad strokes because it is important. First, he says, rulers, or if you have a King James principalities. This word can be translated chief rulers or magistrates. And as I read multiple sources and, and kind of did my best to, to kind of think through what is he referring to here when he's saying rulers, the best I could come up with is that like there is a hierarchy in heaven, there are archangels and angels and cherubim and seraphim. There's, there's different categories and functions and roles and ranks. So there are also different functions and roles and ranks in the kingdom of darkness. And it makes sense, right? Because they, they originated from the kingdom of light. So Satan sets up his own thing. And these rulers, it seems to me that, that the consensus tends to be that these are, if you would, 
what would be like the archangel in, in heaven. This is the top tier, the top rank. These rulers, these chief rulers, these magistrates are our delegated authority from their Lord, from their lowercase Lord, but Satan. To rule and exercise authority over the countless hordes and swarms of evil spirits. So th this is like the top tier, if you would. Also, if you remember in the book of Daniel, in, in around chapters 8, 9, 10, Daniel's praying and he's realizing a lot of things and, and he's interceding on behalf of Israel. And the angel comes to him with a vision from the Lord, with a message from the Lord. But he says, hey, I was held up by the prince of Persia, the ruler of Persia, the, the, the prince, the principality, the, the, the chief ruler in the kingdom of darkness who is over this region geographically. We started fighting on my way from heaven to you. And so I'm sorry I'm late. Fascinating story. You can read it yourself. Daniel, I'd start in chapter eight and just keep reading for a few chapters. But evidently there are rulers who are delegated countries or regions or territories that they oversee and rule over and some are more potent than others. Then the second category, uh, the, my ESV, I'll just stick with the word, the, you know, the verbiage in the ESV for today. Uh, the authorities, the authorities uh, called powers in the King James. These, these authorities are evil spirits that keep people in bondage. And, and in this way, uh, if, if before we're talking in a super big picture, large scale way, I would say that these authorities are very much more personally interactive with people. A spirit of fear, a, a spirit of lust, a spirit of what, whatever it might be. And this includes at times, we see in the Gospels several times, Jesus rebuking a spirit of infirmity. In other words, a physical symptom, a physical ailment or problem is happening because of these authorities. So there are, there are like these chief rulers who rule in a big picture way because Satan, unlike God, is not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at once. So he delegates authority to, to the biggest and the baddest in, in his crew. But then there are also people who people, excuse me, I'm distracted just like you are, uh, spirits who, who menace and, and, and keep people bound with various sins or other things. Thirdly, this, this is an interesting phrase, cosmic powers over this present darkness. By the way, there's a book called This Present Darkness by Frank Peretti. I'd encourage you to read it. I read it, I think, right after high school or maybe at the tail end of high school. So it's been a while, but um, don't take it as doctrine. It's not meant to be a course in theology or anything, but it helps wrap your mind around what's happening, not only in our physical world, but also with the spiritual realm. And in the beginning of the book, you'll read parts and, and you're, you're totally in the physical world. You're in like a newspaper office or like a local church. You're like reading just kind of a generic story. But then it shifts and you're totally reading about what's happening in the spiritual world. And, and Frank Preddy starts and they're two very distinct and separate worlds. But then it, it was fascinating to me. He did a great job with the book. I, I need to read it again. But he, he over time begins to show and demonstrate how these two worlds aren't so distinct after all and how what's happening in, in one is, is very much interlocked and intertwined with what's happening in the other until the very end and climax of the story of the book. 
it's one big thing. There is no distinction. What's happening in the physical world and what's happening in the spiritual world is simply what's happening. And that is truthfully the reality. It's not distinct, really. It is in a sense, but also it's all very much intertwined and interlaced. cosmic powers over this present darkness the best i could come up with is that these forces that paul's referring to here work also in a very big picture way but but in 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 this way ruling over culture and ideology and and philosophy and 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 these kinds of of thoughts the root word for education is really about Enlightenment. Teachers, technically, are those who enlighten. To bring a first grader out of the dark and into the light of reading full sentences or doing multiplication or whatever. These forces over this present darkness, they are at work, I think, as best as I can tell, this category of, of, of being is, is working to keep people in the dark. And for some, it's science. And for some, it's, it's, it's lofty thoughts and ideas that, that they're learning. You know, you can think cultural Marxism and all of the offshoots of that way of thinking or, or progressive Christianity even, or just a lot of these kinds of things that keep people in the dark concerning the good news of Jesus and the truth of the scripture. And then finally, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. What does that mean? People, people, vary in their take again but the best i can come up with is that this category this this rank this group of of demons of of evil spirits fallen angels these are those who transform themselves into the image of light like the scripture says in this way think spiritual things if before we were talking primarily educational things or intellectual stuff, here think mysticism. Think what in the world happened with Joseph Smith? Was he just totally lying? Or did he, I, I personally am of the opinion that, that he likely really did have a very legitimate spiritual experience when he saw this angel of light. But it wasn't the Holy Spirit. It was an unholy spirit. It wasn't the spirit of truth. It was a deceptive spirit. It it, it was one of these spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, presenting things as light when truly their darkness, false religions, cults, new age stuff, mysticism stuff, really spiritual stuff. What happens when people take psychedelics? You ever think about that? It's a thing. Like it is a thing. And with the rise of Joe Rogan's popularity, I enjoy listening to Joe Rogan, honestly. Uh, it's, it's fascinating to hear somebody who's thoughtful and also totally worldly talk, you know, and I, 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 I'm intrigued with him. But with him and his influence come a lot of discussions I've had with especially young guys, you know, like around the water cooler or wherever, like sometimes a Joe Rogan podcast or something will come up and, and the conversations of psychedelics and those sort of things happen. Something's happening. What? Well, we could debate that. But something is happening. What is with all of these world religions, all of these spiritual things and experiences that people experience and encounter, come across? 
I don't think it's mumbo jumbo. Recently, I mentioned that I'm doing catechism questions with my kids. Uh, I, I'm, I'm me, and so I am taking my favorite parts of different catechisms and putting them together and editing, editing them to make them the way I like them. Uh, and one of the questions that I liked, but I wanted to make better, because it's my kid, um, was, is there more than one God? And I didn't want to frame it that way, because if I ask my, my seven-year-old, is there more than one God? And he says, nope. What's he going to think when he encounters all that he can encounter? And so, I mean, and, and honestly, I said that in kind of an ambiguous, suggestive way. But even if my kid just reads the Bible, he's going to be like, okay, there's a lot of stuff going on in here with gods that aren't God. Um, so what's going on? Um, so I framed the question like this. Is there more than one true and living God? And to that, my son will say, nope. And I like it. Because there are these lowercase g gods, these principalities and powers, these rulers, these, these forces. It's interesting and intriguing. And it's important to be aware of. Paul, in writing to the Ephesians, and the church is there that this would be circulated to in Asia Minor. He makes, he makes a point to take legitimate time and space in this letter to address this stuff and to say, be strong. And he sandwiches verse 12 between twice saying, put on the armor of God. And we're really going to hit the armor of God next week because I, I don't want to rush through it. And I didn't want to rush through this today. But for the sake of today, we could simply say, put on Christ. Huh? Yeah. What is the armor of God? The helmet of salvation. Who is our salvation? It is Jesus, the Christ. Put on the belt of truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to the Father but by me. Put on the belt of truth. Put on Christ. Through the list, the gospel, feet shod. It's him. Who gives us faith and ignites our faith who is the word through which our faith comes it's Jesus the Christ it's him it's him and we'll go through and we'll talk about those things more at length but and, and that's worth doing but for today I just want to suffice it to say put on Christ be strong in the strength of his might do not fear because the Bible teaches that he who is in us he who is on us we're in him and he's in us and he is greater than the enemy the enemy's already been defeated well, well, well wait a second if the enemy's already been defeated then what is all this talk about wartime and, and battles and, and like if if the, if the victory is already won, then what are we still fighting for? In conclusion for, for today, I want to address this first by saying there's this idea that, that is very helpful uh, for me in the way it's phrased. The idea of the already and the not yet. Perhaps you've heard that before. Um, But Jesus has already won the victory, crushed the head of the serpent, defeated sin and death once and for all. That is absolutely true. And he has been named as the name above all other names. 
all things have been put under his feet. That is true and that is already true. But it has not yet come to its full fruition or its full consummation, if you would. Remember David, the shepherd boy? Saul, the king, the first king of Israel, he was, he was anointed king and God was with him, but then he no longer walks in step with the Lord in the way that he, he was called to as the leader of God's people. And so the spirit departs from Saul. And God, by his spirit, tells the prophet Samuel, I want you to go to Jesse. And, and I want you to find my king whom I'm appointing and, and who I will put my spirit and anointing on among his sons. And so Samuel goes, and remember, uh, they, didn't, they didn't even think of David because he was the youngest and the smallest and, and all the rest. But after seeing all of the brothers, the Holy Spirit's like, your guy's not here. And so Samuel says to Jesse, do you have any more sons? And he says, well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's Dave out there with the sheep. I'll bring him in. So they bring him in. Long story short, David was the dude. David was the one who God said, yes, Samuel, take a big horn of oil awesome what they used to do back in the day big horn of oil representing gladness in my spirit right and dump the horn of oil on David's head and anoint him as king well he does and David is from that point moving in the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit he is the anointed king of Israel the spirit of God is with him but it is many years before it comes to full fruition and consummation and where David is actually on the throne in Israel. There's all kinds of crazy stuff that happens before that. Read First and Second Samuel. It's great. In a similar way, upon his death and resurrection, Jesus, if you would, is anointed king. The victory's won. But in this age called the church age, the last couple thousand years, before Jesus comes back a second time in power and glory, we are building his body. We're, we're evangelizing and seeing people born again and more and more people saved by grace through faith. We're loving one another and building one another up in love. That's where we're at. And it's not until we see him face to face that the internal struggle we have will be over. The, the cultural struggle and, and the, the, the battle that we're in will be, will be over completely. We'll be saved from the presence of sin altogether when we're glorified together with him. When he comes back and establishes his kingdom, it'll be a great day. But this day, there's a battle raging. We don't have to fear because the victory is secure and we're not functioning on our own strength, okay? Not only are we filled with his power, if we'll just step into it. We're armed with Christ and all that he is and does and brings we can go forth in strength and power and take ground for the kingdom of heaven. And that is thrilling and exciting to me. And as we set out to plant Northwest Church, it's been interesting because I, I just feel as though in some sense, since we started praying about it and since we came here and, and started this new thing, 
I feel like Gehazi, if you remember Gehazi and in, in the stories of the kings, he was a servant of Elisha, the prophet and man of God. And they're surrounded by enemy forces everywhere. And Gehazi starts to freak out like, oh my goodness, we're going down. It's just us. And look at all of these troops. And Elisha isn't shook. He isn't scared. He isn't fearful. He prays to the Lord and says, will you open Gehazi's eyes so that he can see what's going on? And the answer to that prayer is yes. And the veil of physical world <laughs> is lifted from his eyes and he can see that in the spiritual reality that is in his midst, there are tons of flaming chariots of fire of the angelic host of the Lord. They weren't going down. They weren't going anywhere. And the outcome of the story is interesting and good for Gehazi and Elisha. You can read that one too. Read your Bible. But in some sense, I've, I've just, I mean, like I've known for a long time, but I, I've just really had this sense as I look around, as I hike Roxiana and pray for the city. There is a battle raging over the Rogue Valley. And we need to be aware of that. And we need to not be caught off guard when stuff happens when you're going to teach on spiritual warfare. Relational conflict comes up yesterday, spent hours. And, and it was funny because we even acknowledged it. Everything ended fine, but it was like the enemy would try and just stir up strife as I'm about to teach on all this stuff. Didn't stop there. Chilling with Haley yesterday in the evening. We're, uh, we're, we're just hanging out for a little bit before I was going to keep studying and my phone lights up. It's a 541 number, but I don't have the number saved in my phone. So that's weird. I opened the text. It was like a super provocative text from some woman and it was a provocative picture. And I was like, whoa, I didn't recognize him. And I was sitting next to Haley. It was so funny. I just like, I was like, you know who that is? <laughs> and she was like, no. And I just, I deleted it. But it's like, that kind of thing doesn't happen. Then I'm studying. And there were these two flies, <laughs> one normal fly and one like little weird, tiny kind of fly. I didn't know what it was. And they kept like, hurt, like they were in my Bible and they were just all up on me. And finally I just stopped and I prayed that they'd leave me alone. This morning, Haley and the kids are like something's up and I'm like, what, what's going on? Someone's wandering around the property, like around the house. Like, I don't know if it's a transient guy or a druggie or, or what, but like just milling around. And then as we were pulling out of the driveway, he was like, he like walks up to my window and like trying to get me to stop. And it was weird. Uh, and three minutes later, I realized I forgot my keys. So we're turning around and the next thing you know, I'm getting out. I have to talk with this guy. And it's like, I don't want to over-spiritualize everything that happens in my life. But it is extremely common in my life that Saturdays are heavy. Or when I wasn't teaching on Saturdays in various ministries that I've been you know, doing over the years, the day that I'm going to teach or the day before, and, and a lot of times in the following few hours after, it's heavy. It's heavy. And, and menacing. And it was funny because in the morning, I, I, I was taking a shower and I, I thought to myself, I'm surprised this hasn't been a rougher week in light of what I'm teaching. Like I thought that. And then the day kind of hit the fan. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, the enemy didn't disappoint. Um, but it's true. And, and these things do 
happen. And not everything is because of the enemy. Please, like, if you get a flat, don't just be like, Beelzebub, you know, or whatever. Like, it, it, it may or may not be the case. And the things I just listed may or may not. But, but it, it's hard when these things are repetitive and it's a pattern and it's a trend. Something will come up on a Saturday and I'll, I'll mention something to Haley, like, hey, can you pray for me? And she's just like, yeah, man, it's Saturday. It's all right. We know what this is. One time, me and Pastor John over at, at Applegate, we were co-teaching a retreat together, and we were talking after everybody went to sleep, and he goes, how you doing? And I was like, man, to be honest with you, there is such a heaviness on me tonight. And he, and he just looked at me, and he kind of chuckled with a knowing grin, and he said, he goes, that happens a lot when you teach, huh? And I said, yeah, basically every time before, before and after. And we laughed because he said, you know, I wish I could tell you that goes away. But, but that's part of it. And it means we're doing something right. But not only for those of us who teach the Bible or are engaged in, in some form of vocational ministry, but as a Christian in this life, we have an adversary and as things come up and as stuff goes down it's good and helpful and right to be aware not scared but aware so that we can put on the armor of god and be strong the end of which paul he builds towards prayer we need to be people who pray and fast and intercede like Daniel was interceding when that whole spiritual thing was happening. Because friends, in the United States and in the world, there's a spiritual battle happening. There's a reason why the rise and fall of Mars Hill, if you've heard of that, a podcast about church drama and, and abuses that have happened in church, valid and, and I've, I have all kinds of thoughts on, on the podcast. I listen to it. But it's fascinating to me that a podcast about church junk became, it was, it was in the top 10, if not the top five most listened to podcasts when it was coming out in all of podcasting. Like it was up there with Joe Rogan. I was like, what? Like some Christian podcast that is getting this kind of wide reach. Yeah. It's because it hits a chord. It's because it's real. It's because there's real stuff going on. And the last couple of years have been heated in the spiritual battle that's happening in Medford and the Rogue Valley. But it's my conviction, and I've shared this from the start, from our pre-launch gatherings and the evenings and the commons in there, that God has not forsaken this generation. He's called us to it. He's called us to it. And so with Ephesians, I think the Holy Spirit would say to us, may your eyes be open. May the veil be lifted up. May you see what's happening. A human is not your enemy. Your wife is not your enemy. Your, your, your in-law, your, your kid, your whoever, your coworker, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against our very real adversary. And he hates what's happening with Northwest Church. He hates what's happening in any church or any person's life where Jesus is being exalted and lifted high and where the truth of the gospel is being proclaimed and where people are gathering together in the name of Jesus. But that that must not be something that's intimidating. That needs to be energizing. Again, because we're operating in his strength, by his grace, all we have to do is in faith, step out and step in to all that God has prepared for us. And I believe truly that while darkness is looming, I'm going to speak specifically. I'm not called to everywhere, but I'm called to the Rogue Valley. I'm not called to every city, but I am called to Medford. I don't live everywhere. I live here. Okay. And so I'm going to speak to here. I genuinely 
and thoroughly am convinced and I can see it. There is a battle raging in our midst and there is some darkness looming. But God, I love those but God statements in the Bible. But God, I believe, is planning a burst of light, fresh light, a fresh overflow of his spirit and grace in this city, in this valley, in this church. So I had to say that today. That's what I believe. Let's pray.